Uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Very good. Uh, my name is Tim Evans from the Archaeology Data Service based within the Department of Archaeology at the University of York. Um, my apologies for the uh, title. I swore to myself I'd never resort to that, but there we are. Couldn't think of anything else to say. Um, I'm going to talk to you very briefly today about a project I've been working on. Uh, it's the Rural Roman, the Rural Settlements of Roman Britain project. Um, most of you will have probably come across this in literature at some point. It's a uh, large-scale synthesis of the Roman rural landscape funded by the Leverhulme Trust with a small grant from English Heritage. And it's being primarily undertaken by Mike Fulford at the University of Reading in collaboration with Neil Holbrook and some team at Cotswold Archaeology. Um, the ADS come in as we've been looking at the archive and dissemination elements of the project. And I think quite unique, well, unique, for these type of synthesis projects that are now becoming de rigueur, especially in English archaeology, we've got all this data, let's pile them together and see what we've got. Uh, we were factored in from the very start, I think Mike Fulford's got form in this regard, uh, the LEAP project, with the digital publication of the Silkshire Institute Line, linking to the digital archive, for example. But again, he came to us and said, I want my traditional hard copy monograph to sit on my shelf and subsidiary mon monographs on different finds. But right from the start, when that book hits the shops, I also want the data to go online for people to use. Um, I think that's really kind of a refreshing attitude from Mike, but also just goes to show there's only so much that the academics can actually synthesize and publish if it's not going to take decades. So the idea is that they will do some and everyone else can leap on the data and use it for whatever ends they want. Uh, the data itself, oh, pardon me, the data set itself is your bog standard stuff, a large database tied to a GIS. Um, what the project is doing is it's going through all the unpublished and published sources, primarily excavated but with some geophysics, um, for time and practical reasons really, and looking at what these sources tell us about the Roman rural landscape. A large part of this, and following on from projects such as Richard Bradley's work on the unpublished nature of the Neolithic and Bronze Age uh, Britain and Ireland, is what's called the grey literature. Personally, I don't like the term grey literature at all. I think it's a misnomer, and perhaps it's about 20 years out of date, but that's a whole other talk. Uh, I'm going to refer to them primarily as unpublished reports, of which a scoping part of the project thought there were as many as around 10,000 reports produced in England between 1990 and 2004 that contain significant Roman archaeology. So dissemination was planned from the outset. The data set would come to us. The unpublished reports would uh, be disseminated by the ADS uh, Grey Literature Library, for want of a better word, but also by a bespoke interface. One of the refreshing things about this project as well is normally when I get an archive for a project to work on, it's after the project is finished. I've got about two weeks to a month to sort everything out. So it's very linear. Here's what I've got to do, here's what I've got to do it. I've had two and a half years to think about this. And the final facet I'd like to highlight is actually getting the data to sort of be interoperable with all the other databases and data sets that exist the heritage in England. As, it, as I worked through this data, it became apparent it could do so much more than just sit in one system. So I will talk very briefly about what I've done for that. Um, looking at the unpublished fieldwork reports, um, I should say a big uh, thank you to all the HERs that participated, I say all the HERs that participated in their projects, going through their digital and physical holdings to actually see what they had that pertained to the Roman rural landscape. Uh, they were magnificent and really rose to the challenge. Um, part of my job was then to look at the organisations or individuals that had written these reports and make sure that we had permission to put them online. As you can see, there were over 150 unique organisations and individuals. Around about half of these we already had uh, agreements with by Oasis, such as uh, GSB at Bradford, or Wessex or Oxford, most of the big units, and they were just happy to say, yeah, fine, that's fine, whatever. 
put it on the line. Um, tracking down individuals got somewhat trickier, especially individuals that had uh, <coughs> ceased to be, so to speak. That was somewhat tricky. And uh, in one case, I wrote a 1,000 word email to a rather distinguished but unnamed uh, septuagenarian archaeologist, rather famous, who had dug a series of sites in the late 80s. And they were fantastic reports, all unpublished. And in my mind, I thought, he's not going to want to do this. He's not going to want to do this. So I wrote this really obsequious email and made it really clear how important this was. I had a one word response that just said, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did get back in touch to clarify that whatever was there, that's fine. Um, but actually, across the board, and almost without exception, it was refreshing to see how everyone I got in touch with, all ages, small and large organisations, went, that's a really good idea, that's fine. Can I have the links to the reports when you've finished? Which is what, nearly what everyone said, that's great, I'd like to be able to link them from my website or my database, which is kind of where cog started ticking in my brain. So that was really refreshing, as I say. Another interesting thing was, despite almost 10,000 reports being identified in the scoping project as being uh, about Roman archaeology, when it came down to it, um, there were only just over 2,000 reports that were, this is unpublished, that were found to really tell us more about the Roman rural landscape. Uh, 1,800 of these were new, and just over 300 of these were already in the ADS Library of Ideoasis system. I thought that was quite interesting. Again, it started to make me think about the value of a report and how they're recorded. Um, all the reports have now gone live. Uh, you can find them. I hope most of you are familiar with our Grey Literature Library interface. Um, and they can all be found. The ones that have come directly from the project as a unique source there you can look at and go through them. And it's a really interesting snapshot of the reporting in rescue, late rescue and early PPG-16 uh, archaeology in the country. So you get two-page typeset reports from the 80s right up to 2013, 2014, where you have hundreds of pages, embedded vector images, so on and so forth. Really, really rather interesting. Here's an example here, rather blurry black and white photo. The other interesting thing was, of course, is that a lot of these sites, especially in gravel quarries, aren't just Roman. So we're also picking up sites with other um, periods. And here's a more modern report. So again, this got me thinking about value a bit more. So again, if you were just to type the search Roman into the ADS library, you'd get 5,322 results. Um, the figures I've just shown so that there's rather a lot in there that may not be of interest to the Roman researcher. So I started looking at a couple, and then you've got the traditional unstratified Roman pottery in the top fill of a ditch, for example. You also have interesting cases like this, and this is one that's actually come through Oasis. And you can see here, it's excavation of a water pipe trench through a scheduled monument, the scheduled monument being a Romano Celtic temple. And accordingly, the metadata entered is temple Roman, pottery Roman. There's no such thing as pottery in the uh, vocabularies that should be shared, but never mind. When you actually read the report, they found nothing, absolutely nothing. The cable trench had no impact at all, not even unstratified shared. So that's a really interesting false positive that if you were to look at that, you'd think, oh, great. I'm going to find something here, but there's nothing. But it, it, equally, it's interesting about negative evidence as well. So I think there's something else to consider in terms of how we structure our library in the future. So what the bespoke interface does that will be launched on the 14th of April 2015 um, is offer a more detailed and indeed nuanced way of looking at both the published and unpublished data. Uh, the database behind it is, because of the amount of specialists involved, huge. There's a lot of fields. Anything you want to know about Roman archaeology, apart from pottery, um, that has been, not been included for this study, is in there. So hopefully you can see some of the terms there. Again, you can get very uh, high-level terms, major site type, settlement form, 
interesting things, size of settlement, presence of paddocks and enclosures, the type of building, if there was post-Roman activity on the site, the agricultural economy. So what you get the idea, this database goes on and on and on and on. You can really search some interesting stuff. Um, what I've also added in is that kind of meta-analysis of the uh, published and unpublished sources themselves. So in this case, if you wanted to just look at what the unpublished evidence tells us about Romani British uh, Romani Celtic temples, you can. So this is a search for just that term. I want to look at all Romani Celtic temples present in the grey literature. And this is classified according to the project team. And database returns this beautiful map, which at this point, uh, the project investigator, Mike, said, basically, I want a Roman atlas, Tim. I want everything to go on a beautiful map, a Roman atlas. So originally, I tried to get uh, permission to reuse the data behind the Ordnance Survey map of Roman Britain. That wasn't straightforward and hit a snag, and I was pulling my hairs out, hairs out for weeks. And one day, idly browsing the Pelagius website, I came across this beautiful digitized version of the Barrington Atlas of the Roman Empire. Uh, so it stretches, of course, far beyond Britain, uh, which is available to reuse as a WMS layer. And uh, there's a citation for it. If anyone else isn't aware of this, it really is a thing of beauty. I can be found late at night just scrolling in and out as everything. It really has saved my bacon there. So um, again, at the project conference in April, I'll be sure to give a big shout out to the Pelagius project. But again, I, that is a really important uh, thing, aside from joking about it. it. The data was just sitting without any context whatsoever. The Kivitas capitals, the small towns, the villas, known burial sites. I think it really does add a, a layer to it. So again, this is just going back to our Romano uh, Celtic temple. And again, you get a more data than appears on the screen, and you'll also see the unpublished sources held in the AGS library that relate to that site. In this case, there's a two done by NAU and the Suffolk unit. And again, you can continue hammering the database to your heart's content. For example, show me all religious ritual and funeral sites from the north of England, or tile production sites. And already, even as some of the very minimal knowledge of Roman archaeology already, you can start to see interesting trends in the data. For example, these are all tile production sites, regardless of publication medium, and they all seem to be on the western side of the Pennines for some reason. It's quite interesting. Likewise, there seems to be more religious sites on the eastern side. Interesting questions can start popping up. Of course, uh, more astute amongst you will see that's all a very call and response mechanism to the database. Perhaps you might want to see some of those layers interacting a bit more. So uh, as well as the database putting in your queries, this has also been replicated to an extent within a web mapping interface. Uh, again, part of the joy of the project, as far as I'm concerned, is having the time to actually spend investigating the best mechanism doing this via the ADS. In previous years, uh, we've gone down the Esri route. Indeed, as a child of Esri from the early 2000s, it was always very tied to the Esri systems. Um, we started looking into other alternatives, and again, had the time to investigate open layers and GeoServer for hosting WMS services, and it really is great. I think probably speaking to the converted here, but so much easier than Esri ever was, and allowing a great deal of flexibility in how you present data as well. So it's kind of a nice open source alternative to what we use. And again, you can start pulling in a whole range of WMS layers now to add that context. So the aforementioned Barrington Atlas, courtesy of Pelagios, uh, overlaying with another network of Roman roads, but also BGS data. This is drift geology on top of a topography map, and again with a network of Roman roads. Uh, the ubiquitous uh, Google satellite image, which I didn't include, just to be different, and then Mike specifically asked me to include it. Everyone loves a Google satellite image. And then I started looking at some of the other data that the ADS held and could actually be reused more effectively in a kind of geospatial environment. 
So this is uh, all excavations, uh, evaluations and watching briefs from England from 2000 to 2010. And this is pulled from a data source we hold called the Excavation Index, which is part of the National Record of the Historic Environment, the artist formerly known as the NMR, and which we hold as part of our ARC search data set. And what this shows, I always think quite interesting, and what's good to have it in this uh, mapping service, is that the trends in, in what we may call intrusive archaeological investigation are very geographically skewed towards what we may call the central belt around London and going into the Midlands, the East Midlands and South and Yorkshire. You get markedly less work in the Southwest Peninsula and indeed the Northwest and parts of the West Midlands. So when you're asking questions of the data set, I think you'll be able to say, well, is this a nature of the archaeological evidence or a nature of the investigative trends in British archaeology? I think it's quite interesting and uh, necessary. And again, you can start showing, I've got three weeks, probably four weeks left to work on this. I've already got to work on my colour schemes. And it's getting quite garish. Um, here, for example, this is the aforementioned uh, excavations in pink. And then you can look at those red brownie dots there are cremation burials. Uh, so again, you can start looking at all these cultural trends and trying to weigh it off slightly against the investigative biases. The black squares are shrines as well. So you can imagine the, the richness of this map. Again, I could just bombard you with images ad nauseum, but I won't do that. Uh, one interesting facet, again, is uh, actually linking it to uh, other data sources. So I came across this one while testing it, uh, searching on shrine and well. And it highlighted this site, Rothwell Hay in Leeds, and this is a description, uh, part of the description of the site from uh, the uh, summary produced by the team at Reading. Uh, I've just highlighted in bold some really interesting terms about the site, such as the type of wood used for the various implements, the fact that it was a human adult skull, I think adult as opposed to any other age group, and then the ceramic dating to a particular part of the Roman period. Oh, that's quite interesting, it's an interesting site this. I then started looking at the site in more detail and this is where my OCD really kicked in and something I've been obsessing over for years is the fact that it's not only this project that will, and the report that will describe this particular site, it is also known by various other guises within the Heritage Network. So it also has an Oasis ID, the AIP also classified it, um, it has a museum accession ID, an NMR, BIAB, it has three HER IDs, has a monument, the source for that report, an event, the event, and indeed the unit knows it by two things as well. So I became quite obsessive in collecting all these within the database, unbeknownst to my colleagues at Reading and Cotswold at the time, who thought I was going crackers, and looking at various low-tech and high-tech ways of getting these out of the reports. Um, what that means is that hopefully you can start using when you find a record in uh, the Roman Rural Settlement database, you can start using some of these to hyperlink out to other resources, including the Heritage Gateway or there's some bespoke HDR systems out there, um, such as Northumberland, which we hold, and at Surrey, but also perhaps uh, to various unit websites as well if they hold extra information. And then, oh, sorry, I keep on hitting that microphone. And then vice versa as well. And what I will do at the end of the uh, project, once the dust has cleared and I make sure Mike hasn't thrown me to the lions, is uh, to send out an email, probably on HDR forum, with a few other avenues as well by the ADS, to say, here's a data set, get in touch, and I can do an export for you. If you have a particular unit, you want to know what records we have for GSB, for example, you do that, HERs, so on and so forth. Happy to do so. And I think uh, there'll be a really interesting kind of longevity part of the project, is not just looking at the 14th, but hopefully getting people to link out. Oh, sorry, that's the Rothwell Hayes site again. And this is just an example of linking 
via those HCR records to the Heritage Gateway. Uh, so, in honour of the late Mr Nimoy, most of you are going, fascinating. The astute amongst you will be thinking, that's great. After you all pat yourselves on the back, and there's a beautiful Google satellite image, and there's dots on maps, we can all go home and forget about it. Um, at various points in this project, other people have said to me, that's great, you synthesised all the excavated evidence going back to the 80s. What's going to happen in 10 years' time? Um, and this got me thinking about how we can do this better in the future. This is a uh, quote taken from a small publication by some colleagues of mine at the ADS in 2001. And it, uh, this was at the birth of the OASIS project. And it's a rather optimistic, but I like it, about the need for, you know, data's going to be instant. Our researchers are going to be able to get indexes to what they're interested in like that. You know, this is really going to push data forward. I think, and as much as I love the Oasis project, I like to think of it as a member of the family. You love it, but you know it's false. It arguably hasn't succeeded in that aim to date. Uh, this is, again, just a map of excavation trends, just a density map for the rural landscape and just uh, weighted for urban areas. Here, you can see these are the excavated trends in 2000 to 2010, which coincides with the birth of the Oasis project. As we've seen previously, it is very geographically biased. If you look at the equivalent um, watching brief evaluations, excavation events through Oasis, you can see it's brilliant in matching it in the east of England and indeed Leicestershire. That's all due to you lass who love uh, Oasis. In other parts of the country, it's maybe overrepresented or in the north of England, incredibly underrepresented. And again, there are a myriad of reasons for that. Some units just don't like Oasis and it's all dependent on the HERs. If the HERs don't want to use the system, then it's not enforced and no one uses it. So you get a very interesting split in the amount of digital information becoming available. This is something that's been highlighted and indeed Oasis is being redeveloped and plan to be redeveloped in the future. And that's how to get away from this skewing of data. Um, as part of that will also be allowing people to flag up sites that are of interest. Uh, this is a uh, wiki of the East Midlands Research Framework. It's not yet live, it will go live in the near future. Hopefully most of you are familiar with research frameworks. They're the paper documents the West Midlands one, for example, retails at £100. The uh, research framework for Yorkshire was last updated in 2001. Um, th yeah, they need updating as well. Part of the an optimistic strategy for research frameworks is to move them away from the paper-based monograph and to make them online documents. And hopefully a part of OASIS will be to link through to these so when you are creating a record, whether you are a unit, uh, a commercial, uh, commu uh, community archaeologist or academic, you can upload your report and you can flag up its significance. So, for example, whoever uploaded that report for Oxford, for the temple, could say, yeah, we're working at a Roman site, but we found nothing. This is of no significance to you. You know, only you to be really interested in these kind of meta-analyses. Uh, otherwise, people say, this is a really fantastic site for looking at later 2nd and 3rd century pottery assemblages, or indeed looking at particular types of wood. So I think this is very much uh, looking forward, nothing's planned, but how see how it will work with what Michael talked about yesterday with NLP, with more sophisticated extraction of metadata, maybe expanding vocabularies as well, to be a bit more detailed. But I think really actually getting people to engage with their data just a little bit more, and making it easier. So rather than entering the bare minimum, about the site, they're actually encouraged to say, by recording this detail, I can actually see people reusing this. And then hopefully, we won't have to wait another 10, 20 years for another synthesis of Roman Britain, but it can be done perhaps a bit quicker and a bit, bit easier. Um, that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>